Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Salutations, friends. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture Series. We have a really exciting lecture tonight on black holes uh, that should pique everyone's interest. So thank you for joining us on your Friday evening. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a computational astrophysicist here at Caltech, and I will be the MC for this evening's event. Uh, the rough schedule for tonight will be, I will shortly introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Nikita Kamraj, who will give us a roughly a 30 minute presentation on black holes and, and the, the elusive uh, enigmatic corona that surrounds active galactic nuclei and, and active black holes. And then right after that, we'll jump straight into a Q&A session. But unlike most Q&A sessions, this will be questions and answers for both um, the content of the presentation that Nikita gives, as well as just general questions about astronomy and astrophysics and space science. Uh, we will be joined by two other uh, members of the Caltech Astronomy and Planetary Sciences Department, Shreyas Vizapragada, um, who is a PhD candidate in planetary science, as well as Catherine Plant, who is a PhD candidate in the astronomy department. So all of us have different specializations in the field, and we'll try and field the questions that you guys throw at us as best we can. So I encourage you guys to start thinking already about what questions you might want to ask. And feel free to, when you have a question, either during the content, during the talk or or um, afterwards during the Q&A, you can write them in the either the YouTube channel comments or the Facebook comments associated with this because we're streaming on both of those platforms right now. Um, other quick announcements. We are going to be hosting our next event. There's an astronomy on tap in two and a half weeks that will be um, all about James Webb Space Telescope. So we had uh, an astronomy on tap already a, a week and a half ago about J the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's new flagship space telescope that will be launching hopefully in about a month's time from South America and doing some really cool stuff uh, kind of as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, although Hubble's still kicking and still doing okay up there. Uh, and then that, that astronomy on tap will deal with we'll have two researchers who work on extragalactic and cosmological. So large scale things in the universe, like the first galaxies and that sort of thing. And uh, in fact, one of the, the members is, a, a, one of the speakers is a member of one of the design teams for one of the instruments near CAM that's going up aboard the James Webb Space Telescope. So that'll be really cool. And then we have another one of these stargazing lectures three weeks from today. I think that's December 10th. And that will be on fast radio bursts, a very exciting kind of uh, growing field in astronomy, describing how uh, these mysterious explosions in, in other galaxies, we, we see them in radio waves for a very short period of time. And then we're trying to learn what, what the heck is going on, as well as what that can tell us about the intervening uh, distance and, and what's going on in the space in between us and those objects. So Liam Connor, a postdoc in the department, will be talking about that. Anyway, and I'll start putting things together for, for the spring, uh, start at like the new year. I want to do stuff in person. We may have our hands tied a little bit in terms of doing these stargazing lectures back at Caltech because of vaccination status and having to check that and wearing a mask indoors and all of these things that Caltech has legitimate rules, but but it means it's harder to hold an in-person public event. But I'll have all the, we'll, we'll continue in one way or another, either online or uh, in person, or have a, a, a live stream of an in-person event so that those of you who aren't able to attend in person are, are still kept in the loop. But I think that's enough yapping from me. Um, Nikita, do you wanna do you wanna join me here? Hi. Hi. Nice to um, see you. Nice to cool, cool background. Cool background. Um, can you tell me what it is or are you gonna talk about that specifically in your in your presentation? I'm gonna talk about it in my presentation. Okay. So I okay. can go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, go ahead and please do. So uh, let me introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Nikita Kamraj, recently doctored. She just finished her PhD 
just a few months ago, um, successfully defended. Congratulations, Nikita. Um, so Dr. Nikita Kamraj is a postdoctoral researcher in observational high energy astrophysics at Caltech. She recently completed her PhD in astrophysics at Caltech, where her thesis focused on the study of accreting supermassive black holes known as active galactic nuclei. Um, she uses spectroscopic data from X-ray telescopes to investigate the nature of the material surrounding and powering these supermassive black holes. As a postdoctoral researcher, she continues to study active galactic nuclei in X-ray light, particularly unusual rare ones that do not follow traditional models, and thus they challenge our current understanding of active galactic nuclei physics. Outside of academic research, Nikita has a strong interest in Japanese culture and loves learning Japanese, watching anime and cosplaying. She also enjoys dancing and meeting new people through all walks of life. Me too, me too. Um, cool, okay, well, I will, I will let you take it away. Thank you for joining us tonight, Nikita. Thank you, Cameron, for the introduction and thank you to the viewers for joining me today. So hopefully this talk will convey how exciting yet mysterious supermassive black holes are and how we can use X-ray telescopes to crack the enigmatic nature of these black hole systems, which are actually one of the most brightest and energetic objects in our universe. In particular, I'm going to be talking about a structure called the corona, which is a really key component of accreting black holes. And the study of the corona and supermassive black holes has been the primary research topic of my PhD thesis. So first, before I dive into the presentation, I want to give a very quick disclaimer. These astrophysical coronae bear no relation whatsoever to the novel coronavirus that has been disrupting our lives for the past almost two years. The only similarity is that they both can be deadly, but in wildly different contexts. So while astrophysical coronae are much less famous than the viral pandemic of the same name, hopefully my talk today will convey just how critical this small structure is in powering the emission from some of the most luminous objects in our universe. So with that, black holes have always been a really popular focus of attention for astronomers and the public alike. And rightly so, because they're indeed one of the most mystifying objects in our universe. But in this talk, what I'm gonna try and do is demystify black holes a bit by addressing some common questions, such as, can we have more than one type of black hole? Do black holes actually appear black? How can we form black holes and what are they made up of? How can we see black holes and study them? Now, for some of these questions, there isn't one clear answer and there are still many more open questions about the nature and behavior of black holes, particularly from a theoretical side. This talk is gonna give more of an observer's view into black holes rather than focus on the theoretical perspective. So with that, I'm just gonna lay out the roadmap for what this talk is going to cover today. I'm first gonna introduce the different kinds of black holes that can exist and how they're different from each other. I'm then going to focus on the biggest and coolest kind of black hole, in my opinion, which are supermassive black holes. Crucial to powering these supermassive black holes is the corona, which I'm going to spend some time talking about. Is also, in my opinion, the coolest and most important part of the supermassive black hole. This opinion is not biased in any way by the fact that I did my PhD on the subject. Now, one of the main ways we can study supermassive black holes and their coronae is through x-rays. And I'm going to talk about how cutting edge X-ray telescopes have transformed our understanding of these objects. And then finally, looking towards the future, I'll highlight how upcoming and proposed X-ray missions are going to open new windows into unraveling the mysteries of supermassive black holes. So first, how do we define something as a black hole? A black hole is basically a region of space time where the force of gravity is so strong that light cannot even escape its pull. So let's step back a little here. What do we mean by a space time? So the famous scientist Albert Einstein in the 1900s developed a theory of general relativity in which space and time are combined into this single geometric entity called a space time, which makes up the fabric of the universe. So what makes the gravitational field of a black hole so strong? Well, according to general relativity, matter causes curvature of the space time fabric and the greater the mass of something, the more the amount of curvature. 
by definition, a black hole contains a really large amount of mass in a very small volume, and this causes extreme curvature of space-time. The center of the black hole is called a singularity, and it's where the density and force of gravity become infinite, and the laws of physics basically break down at this point. Around the black hole, we can define a boundary called the event horizon, and the radius of this circular boundary is given by the Schwarzschild radius, and the event horizon is essentially a point of no return. So anything that passes beyond the event horizon, including light, can't escape, which means we can't receive information from an object once it passes the event horizon. And this is probably the most mysterious aspect of black holes and firmly occupies the land of theory and speculation, providing a lot of food for science fiction. But this is as far as we're gonna go into delving into the nitty gritty of the theory of black holes for today. I'm going to talk about how we can actually observe and characterize these black holes. So how can we make a black hole in the first place? Well, one way a black hole can be formed is at the end stage of the evolution of a massive star. So these black holes are called stellar mass black holes because they have masses similar to that of stars like our sun. So to give a brief 101 on stellar evolution, when stars form, you can group them into two different kinds of mass ranges, high mass and low mass. And depending on how heavy a star is, the way it's going to evolve and die will be different. A typical star like our own sun would be in the low mass range. And the way it evolves when it runs out of fuel to burn is it will expand to become a red giant and eventually shed its outer layers to form a planetary nebula. And then whatever remains of the star that's left behind is called a white dwarf. But for massive stars, when they die, they puff up a lot and explode violently as a supernova. And then the remnant that is left behind will either collapse under gravity to form a neutron star or a black hole. But stellar mass black holes aren't the only kind of black hole that exists in our universe. At the center of every galaxy resides a supermassive black hole that can have a mass that's millions to a billion times the mass of our sun. This is a huge difference in mass between the stellar mass black holes that are formed from dying stars, because even the largest stellar mass black holes only weigh about 100 times that of our sun. In between these two mass ranges, there may exist intermediate mass black holes, but there isn't conclusive evidence yet that these exist because we haven't directly observed them. Supermassive black holes, on the other hand, can be observed both directly and indirectly. And in fact, the discovery of the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020. And another fun fact, Andrea Guess actually completed her PhD at Caltech. So the way uh, these two astronomers, uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Guess, made this discovery was by tracking the orbits of stars in the center of our galaxy really precisely. And what they found was that these stars were orbiting around an invisible object that was around 4 million times the mass of our sun in the center of our galaxy, which they then inferred must be a supermassive black hole. And it was called Sagittarius A star. So the fact that supermassive black holes exist at the center of every galaxy in our universe raises a big question of how can you form them in the first place? And these black holes, they're way too massive to be produced from the death of a single massive star. So how can they grow to be millions to even a billion solar masses? And the short answer to this is we still don't really know. It's basically one of the biggest open questions in astronomy. But that being said, we do have some theories about the different pathways by which we can grow a black hole to a supermassive scale. So this diagram shows uh, the two different pathways by which we think we can grow black holes to a supermassive size. So the first way is through the earliest stars that it actually appeared in our universe, which were really massive. They're as large as 100 times the mass of our sun. So these are called POP3 stars. And when they die in a massive supernova explosion, they leave behind seed black holes which can then grow by feeding off matter in their surroundings and then merging with other black holes to eventually form supermassive black holes that are millions of solar masses. Then the other way that seed black, seed black holes can be formed is through the direct collapse of a cloud under gravity. So these direct collapse black holes can then grow in a similar manner by accreting material 
and merging with other galaxies to eventually form supermassive black holes. And both of these pathways um, can also produce leftover intermediate mass black holes. But a really big mystery that remains is that we, we can see supermassive black holes that have already grown to be millions of times the mass of our sun very early on in the universe. And it remains a puzzle how these early black holes grew to such a monstrously big size in such a short time. There is one possibility that the halo of dark matter that collapsed to form the seed black hole just had a really high initial mass, but still it's a very open question. Now, even though we haven't yet figured out how exactly supermassive black holes form, we have made great strides in detecting them. And one of the biggest scientific achievements in this decade has been our ability to image a black hole for the first time. So on the left here is the first image that was produced by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration of the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy called M87. And this image was produced using data that was synchronized uh, from telescopes around the world, which basically allows us to achieve a really high angular resolution. It's equivalent to being able to read a newspaper in New York when you're sitting in a cafe all the way in Paris. So what we're seeing in this image is the bright ring and dark shadow that's produced by gravity bending the light being emitted by matter falling into the black hole near the event horizon. I'm also gonna play a simulation and this shows how matter can form an accretion disk and fall into the supermassive black hole, causing it to shine brightly. So this clearly demonstrates how we can dispel the myth of black holes being completely black and invisible to us because material falling into and being accreted by the black hole actually shines very brightly. And sometimes jets can even be launched from the black hole in opposite directions, and we can observe these jets with radio telescopes. Now, you may be wondering uh, why in this um, Event Horizon Telescope image of a black hole, the light appears brighter on one side than the other. And this is due to an effect called Doppler boosting. So just like when an ambulance or a car with sirens approaches you, the sound gets louder. Light also behaves in a similar manner in that it gets brighter when it's moving towards you because the waves all bunch up and the frequency of light goes up. When light moves away from us, the waves stretch out and so it appears dimmer. Now there's a specific name that we call these supermassive black holes that have an accretion disk of material surrounding them, uh, with, which, which they feed off of, and these are called active galactic nuclei or AGN for short. About 10% of all galaxies are active galaxies, and some galaxies can even go through phases of the supermassive black hole, showing AGN activity by actively accreting material, and then other times where it's quiescent or inactive. And in fact, our own Milky Way galaxy in the past used to show AGN activity and had an accretion disk, but now it's in a quiet phase where there's no clear accretion disk present around the supermassive black hole. So there's various structures that make up an AGN. In all AGN surrounding the black hole and the accretion disk is a donut-shaped torus of gas and dust. This torus can sometimes block a lot of the light that we can see from the AGN and make them dimmer than usual. But I told you that material falling into a black hole makes it shine brightly. How exactly does that light get produced? This is where the corona enters the picture. So what exactly is a corona? It's essentially a really hot plasma of gas that usually contains energetic particles like protons or electrons. And we can find coronae throughout the universe. Our own sun has a corona, and we can see this during a total solar eclipse as this diffuse, wispy kind of emission around the sun. A corona is also a really important component of an accreting black hole, whether it's an accreting stellar mass black hole or a supermassive one. So why is the corona so important? Well, the corona is essentially what's powering this bright emission that we're seeing from these accreting black holes. Accreting black holes shine really brightly in x-rays and the corona is what's producing all of that x-ray light. So how exactly does this bright x-ray light get produced by the corona? Well, the process is called Compton scattering and I'm going to explain step-by-step step what this is. 
So when matter forms an accretion disk around a black hole, it heats up due to friction as material pushes against each other. It's kind of similar to the heat that your hands produce when you rub them together. And what this does is it causes visible light to be emitted from the accretion disk itself as, moder as matter falls into the black hole. And this is called a thermal disk emission. Now the light from the accretion disk is optical light. It's the kind of light that our eyes can detect, but when it scatters off particles in the corona, its energy gets boosted up to X-rays. And this is what Compton scattering is where energetic particles like electrons in the corona scatter off the visible light that's coming from the accretion disk and boost the energy of that light so that it becomes x-rays. And this is what we call the coronal emission. So what makes the corona so special that we should just focus on studying it? Well, despite being the powerhouse of accreting black holes driving all of the x-ray emission, the nature of the corona is shrouded in a lot of mystery. So what things do we actually know about the corona in AGN? We do have some rough estimates of the size of the corona, which indicate it's a physically compact structure. And one main technique that is used to measure the size of the corona is called microlensing. So similar to the lens in a pair of glasses or in a telescope, matter itself can also act as a lens and bend the light from distant objects. In microlensing, a star is what acts as the lens, and it bends the light from a distant background galaxy, sometimes creating multiple magnified images. And because the corona inside an active galaxy is so compact, it tends to get really strongly lensed if the alignment is just right. So through these kinds of techniques, we can get an indication of the size of the corona. But what about its other properties, like its shape, location, and origin? And the short answer to that is it's unknown. It's precisely what makes the corona so enigmatic. So there's been a lot of work done with theory and simulations, trying to investigate possible geometries and locations for the corona, like modeling it to be like a point source above the black hole or as a sphere or as a donut. Um, but the challenge has been to try to observationally test these out, which has been pretty difficult. So how exactly can we study the corona to try and unravel some of its mysteries? And a, well, a main way is by basically observing the radiation that the corona emits, the X-ray light. Now, X-rays have a lot of energy, which means they have short wavelengths. And this makes it impossible to build X-ray telescopes on the ground since the, Earth, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs most of the high energy radiation. So we have to go to space to put our X-ray telescopes. X-rays themselves can be further subdivided into lower energy and higher energy X-rays. The lower energy ones are called soft X-rays and the higher energy ones are called hard X-rays. And there are different kinds of X-ray telescopes up in space, some of which only detect soft X-rays, others only detect hard X-rays, and some can detect both hard and soft X-rays. The universe itself is actually filled with X-ray light, as there are lots of different kinds of astrophysical phenomena and objects that can produce X-rays. This is an image of how the entire sky looks in X-rays, produced just last year with data from the Erosita X-ray telescope, which was launched in 2019. And this is actually the first all-sky map of the universe produced in X-rays in more than 30 years. And it was made with data collected from the Erosita telescope over six months. This resulting image is actually quite spectacular. The X-ray sky looks quite different from how it appears in the visible light that our eyes can see in. And this map actually contains more than a million X-ray objects, many of which are newly detected AGN that are really, really far away from us. The reddish colors correspond to cooler regions and our lower energy X-rays, while the bluer regions are hotter um, and are produced by higher energy X-rays. And since this is an all-sky map of the universe, this band across the center is our own Milky Way galaxy, which indeed looks like a band across the sky from the Earth. And there are lots of accreting stellar mass black holes within our own galaxy, several of which are marked um, in this map, like SIG X1 and SCO X1. Now, most of the X-ray satellites that we have currently in orbit are soft X-ray telescopes that can only detect lower energy X-rays. But there is one X-ray telescope that's revolutionized X-ray astronomy with its launch, and that's the New Star Telescope. 
New Star was launched in 2012, and it's the first X-ray telescope in orbit capable of focusing hard X-rays. So that means high energy X-rays. There's no other telescope that can detect hard X-rays with the high level of sensitivity that New Star has, since these instruments aren't able to focus high energy X-rays. So why is it that these other telescopes aren't able to focus high energy X-rays, and how has New Star managed to do it? So the thing about X-rays is that they're really difficult to bend and bring to a focus. And this is because they're so energetic that they just pass through most objects, including mirrors. It's why we use X-rays to image our body since they pass through everything except the bones. And the higher the energy of the X-ray, the more difficult it becomes to bend it and bring it to a focus. The way New Star gets around this problem is by using a special kind of mirror technology where several shells of concentric mirrors are nested within each other and then orientated to be parallel to the incoming X-rays so that they just graze the mirror surface and get reflected. And we call this grazing incidence. And then the secret recipe to being able to reflect the high energy X-rays is that the mirrors themselves are coated with multi-layers of alternating high density and low density materials, which makes the mirrors way more reflective than a standard mirror. There is a trade-off of making the telescope able to focus high energy X-rays, and that's that the focal length, which is just the distance to the focal point where an image is formed, is really long. The focal length of the New Star Telescope is 10 meters long. So on the ground, it's really difficult to build and assemble a 10 meter long telescope to attach to a rocket to shoot up into space, especially since New Star is a small explorer mission with a low budget. So what instead was done was the entire telescope was folded up inside a lightweight stowed mast when it was launched into space. And I'm going to play a, a simulation now of how this mast was folded out in space once the satellite was in orbit. New Star was also the first telescope to have its entire focal length of 10 meters extended out in space with a deployable mast. And this entire process of folding it out took about 24 minutes, which is actually a really long, tense time when you compare it to the few minutes it typically takes for a rover to land on Mars, for example. And the mast itself isn't completely rigid. It can move due to space wind or debris or just thermal expansion. And that motion can affect the image that's formed at the detectors. So to combat this, there are lasers that point from the optics to the detectors in order to track the motion of the mast and correct for it. So the launch of uh, New Star was very successful and smooth. And once it was in orbit, New Star really opened a new window into the X-ray universe, making a lot of groundbreaking science discoveries. So with an unparalleled sensitivity and resolution in high energy X-rays, New Star has essentially provided us with the new lens through which we can observe the universe. So this image on the left is of an AGN and its host galaxy, where the different circles show the spatial resolution of some different X-ray telescopes. And we can see that New Star is able to resolve the core of the galaxy where the supermassive black hole resides, which is really important because it's easy for the light from the galaxy itself to dilute and contaminate the light that's coming from the supermassive black hole. Now, even just to highlight all of the revolutionary science discoveries that New Star has made so far would require a talk of its own. So I'm just gonna mention briefly one super cool result. Now, black holes have a property that they're actually able to spin. And for the first time, New Star was able to measure how fast black holes are spinning. This is actually a really difficult thing to measure since black holes can spin in the same direction as the rotation of the accretion disk. We call this prograde rotation, or they could spin in the opposite direction, which is called retrograde rotation, or the black hole may not spin at all. And in general, the faster a black hole is spinning, the closer the accretion disk lies to the black hole. By looking at an X-ray spectrum, which is basically the amount of light coming from the black hole system at different X-ray energies, New Star was able to determine how close the accretion disk lies to the black hole and use that to determine how fast the black hole is spinning. So depending on which way and how fast the black hole spins, the shape of this spectral profile will be different. And that's what tells us the spin rate of the black hole. We couldn't get an accurate shape of this spectral profile before New Star since there wasn't any other telescope out there able to focus X-ray light at very high energies. 
So I've been talking about how important the corona is, yet we know so little about it. And astronomers have been developing theories for how the corona behaves as far back as the 80s. But it's only in recent years that we've really been able to observationally study the corona and learn more about its properties. And this is all thanks to New Star. So one key property of any object is its temperature. It seems like an easy enough measurement to make. But accurately measuring the temperature of the corona was incredibly difficult to do before the launch of New Star. And this is because to measure the temperature of the corona, we need to know how much energy the particles that make up the corona have. And the way you find that out is by seeing where the spectrum of X-ray brightness versus energy begins to taper off. So what do I mean by that exactly? So this figure on the right is the only scientific plot I'm going to show. And it's a spectrum of an AGN called ARC 564, showing how bright the AGN is at different X-ray energies. And the black dots are data points that were taken with the New Star telescope. So the cooler the corona is, the steeper the line that connects these dots is gonna be. And this is basically how we get an estimate of the temperature of the corona. And in fact, the temperature measured for this particular corona with New Star was one of the lowest temperatures measured for an AGN corona to date. Part of my research focuses on studying these kinds of coronae with uh, really low temperatures and trying to understand how they can be cooling so much. Now, New Star has been fantastic at making pioneering discoveries in many unexplored areas of high energy astrophysics, but what does the future hold beyond New Star? There's definitely a lot to look forward to in X-ray astronomy, uh, with a lot of new X-ray missions being proposed and launched in the coming years. So these missions are hopefully going to give us completely new insights into understanding how accreting black holes behave. And I'm going to give some specific examples of new X-ray missions being launched. One is a Japanese space telescope called CRISM, which stands for the X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission which is going to be launching pretty soon next year. It's an X-ray telescope that operates at lower energies. So it's a soft X-ray telescope and it will have state-of-the-art technology for its detectors that allow us to get a really high resolution X-ray spectrum of sources. And this was basically gonna give us a lot more detail about the different kinds of elements that are near black holes and how the material around black holes um, can behave. Another new mission that's gonna be launched further in the future is a European X-ray observatory called Athena. And this is another telescope that detects lower energy X-rays. It's gonna have the largest X-ray mirror ever built for astronomy and be able to map out the entire X-ray sky at record breaking speeds. And right now is a particularly exciting time. As just two weeks ago, the biggest and most impactful report for the astronomical community was released which is going to influence the science that will be done by astronomers for the coming decades. This report is called the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey, and it basically tries to identify what are the key science challenges and important questions to address in astronomy in the next decade. It's a report that's released every 10 years, and it makes recommendations for ground and space-based missions to invest in the future. So the new James Webb telescope that's gonna be launched soon was actually recommended in the decadal survey from 2000. And then the last survey from 2010 recommended missions like the Roman Space Telescope and the Vera Rubin Observatory. In this current report for the 2020s, strong recommendations were given for X-ray probes to be developed and launched that could complement the Athena mission. My research group has been developing uh, the concept for such a next generation X-ray probe, and it's called HEX-P. This X-ray telescope would act as a direct successor to New Star, and it's currently the only concept mission that would have the ability to focus very high energy X-rays, even higher than the energies that New Star can focus at. So with an even wider range, range of X-ray energies that can be focused and higher sensitivity, HEX-P wouldn't only just be able to detect many more black holes, but also study the corona at an even greater depth. We wouldn't just be able to get precise measurements of the temperature of the corona, but also know what exactly it's made up of. 
So to finish this talk, I'll just say that accreting supermassive black holes are one of the most powerful and brightest objects in our universe, yet they are also one of the most mysterious objects. The corona is what's responsible for powering the bright energetic light that we see from them, but their nature is even more enigmatic. However, with X-ray telescopes like New Star and the launch of future next generation X-ray missions, there are definitely a lot of exciting prospects for cracking the mysteries of accreting black holes and the coronae that power them. So with that, I'll finish my talk and open it up to questions. Excellent, thank you. Very polished presentation and uh, lots of really interesting topics here. I, I have questions too. So, uh, but we got a lot of questions from the audience. Um, I encourage audience members both on face, Facebook as well as YouTube to continue writing uh, in the in the chat uh, your questions and we'll try and get to, to all of them. Um, so at this portion, it, we're opening it up to Q&A, but it's not just Q&A on the content of this presentation. We actually have a full panel of four of us who are gonna try and uh, attempt to answer all of your questions about both black holes and the, the elusive I'm sorry, the enigmatic corona that Nikita was, was describing, but also any kinds of questions that you may have on astronomy or space or I guess physics or whatever you have. Um, so our other panelists, before we start answering the questions, the other panelists, um, Shreyas and Catherine, can I have you guys pop back on? Cool, hey guys, welcome. Um, so just really quickly, I'll have each of you give like a one minute introduction as to who you are and what sort of science you work on, just so our audience knows what they're dealing with in terms of questions that we might be able to, to preferentially field. So, um, Catherine, do you want to start out? Hi, uh, so I'm a graduate student in astronomy at Caltech and I'm a radio astronomer. I'm interested in using a new telescope that we're or an upgrade to a telescope that we're building in the Owens Valley Radio Observatory about a couple hundred miles north of Caltech. Uh, I'm interested in using that to detect the highest energy charged particles that get accelerated in our universe, or in specifically in the galaxy. Uh, and uh, there's a transition to even higher energy particles that are coming from other parts of the universe outside the galaxy. We can detect them with very, very brief 10 nanosecond radio signals. Uh, so that requires some novel uh, computational processing to be able to find them. And we're interested in them because we don't know what in the galaxy makes them. It could be accretion disks around or and jets around small black holes. It could be uh, remnants from supernova from stellar explosions. Uh, and yeah, so I'm working on building the instrument right now and then later using it to study these cosmic rays that's pretty interesting okay so it's all but it's basically using radios radio instrumentation to detect cosmic ray signal signals yes we we don't catch the particle directly we use radio waves to detect it i see okay cool interesting i didn't know you were working on that so that's really cool um Shreyas, would you like to introduce yourself Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Shreyas. I'm a PhD student in the Planetary Science Department at Caltech, so working on some slightly different things. Um, <clears throat> I'm primarily interested in how planets change over time. So I study this by looking at planetary atmospheres and how they change over time with the Hale 200-inch telescope at Palomar Observatory, which is a couple hundred miles south of Caltech. Um, I also have some interest in planetary orbital dynamics, also uh, looking at that with observations and trying to suss out the things that make planetary orbits change from Kepler's laws. So yeah, that's pretty much what I work on. Oh, so is, is it just additional mass and in interior that screws up the orbits and, and makes them depart from Kepler? So for instance, like if you have multiple planets uh, in the same system, they tug on each other. So, you know, they, uh, they can cause some, some wacky effects, uh, if you were to just model them with Kepler's laws, uh, you might not get the right answer. Okay. Also tides. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Um, and yeah, I'm Cameron. I, 
I do computational modeling of how galaxies form and change over really long time scales. Um, in particular, I study what's called the circumgalactic medium, which is this low density material kind of surrounding. It's kind of like a corona, kind of like um, what Nikita was describing in her talk, but instead of around a, a black hole um, or around a star, it's around the galaxy as a whole, kind of permeating that, that entire medium. And like the corona that's being studied by Nikita, it's very difficult to study, it's very low density, and it's hard to observe. So trying to model that with computers to better understand what the heck is going on and how it leads to fueling of the stars in the galaxy and, and ultimately drives the evolution of the galaxy itself. So that's that's what I do. Computer simulations of galaxies is basically it. Um, okay, so let's get to some questions from all of you guys. Lots of them coming through. Here is a good one from Armin Malik Abram Abramian. How do you calculate the mass of a supermassive black hole? Um, so this one seems like a number of people could probably chime in from here, but um, let's start out with Nikita since this is your this is your jam. Yeah, so there are a number of ways that we can try to measure the mass of a supermassive black hole. A really common technique that's used is basically um, taking a spectrum in optical light. So accreting supermassive black holes, they shine really brightly in x-rays. They also dominate the optical light that we see. So we don't see much of the galaxy light. We see a lot of the light from the AGN itself in the optical. And what we can do is we can look at uh, the basically the profile of lines in those spectra of certain elements that are being emitted close to the black hole. So a really common line to use is from hydrogen. And by looking how wide that line is, we can basically use some basic gravitational um, physics principles to determine what the mass of the object that's emitting that light um, is. So material orbits around the black hole, and so it has some kind of radius. And so there's a, a mass that it's orbiting around. It's the mass of the supermassive black hole. So like I was mentioning kind of briefly when I was talking about the Event Horizon Telescope image, the Doppler effect where light approaching us becomes bluer and light moving away from us becomes redder. Uh, you see that effect when you look at um, a spectral line because when something is rotating, parts of it is moving towards us and parts of it are moving away from us. And the faster something's rotating, the more broader that line is gonna become. And the more massive something is, the faster it's going to move around that object. And so that's a way you can essentially calculate the mass of a black hole using optical light. You can do this at other wavelengths too. Um, but optical is a really common form. And then there are also these things that we call scaling relations, where um, there are certain properties of galaxies and black holes that are related to each other. And one of these is um, the amount of, we call it a, a velocity dispersion, but how fast stars in the central regions of a galaxy are moving and you can correlate that with the mass of the supermassive black hole, essentially. And so the more massive something is of the supermassive black hole, um, the greater the velocity of those stars. And that's a more indirect way of determining the mass of a black hole. Um, but those are some, they're those, those are probably the most common techniques. And I'm going to stop talking now so that I'm not dominating the conversation. No, that's okay. That's okay. This is great. This is great. Um, Shreya, sorry, Catherine, do you guys want to chime in at all? No. Seemed like a pretty thorough answer. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Feel free to just chime in where, where you, where you guys feel like you can, you can add something. Uh, additional questions. Okay, Kane asks, what is the smallest 
black hole. So just so we have an idea of how large black holes are, because you were describing, Nikita, in your presentation, these supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies that are, what were the numbers you gave, like a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, something like that. So really big, really big guys. Um, what about the smallest? What are the smallest? What evidence? I mean, I'm happy to yap about this too, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, observationally, uh, the lower end of the black hole spectrum are those stellar mass black holes that are top, that I've been talking about that are formed from dying stars. So when you're talking about stellar mass black holes, they they can be as low as one times the mass of our sun approximately. Um, but on the theory side, um, there is a lot of debate about can you form mini black holes and also whether primordial black holes exist. And these could, again, theoretically be lower than one solar mass, but I think I don't I don't have a good grasp of the theoretical side of black holes, so I can't comment too much about what goes into the theories of mini black holes or primordial black holes. So if other people have done more reading into that, feel free to elaborate. Yeah, I just know that to my knowledge, there aren't a lot of formation mechanisms that we know of that could cause things on that on smaller scales. Um, Primordial, I mean, the name even suggests that these have been around for a really long time. So we don't have good good, uh, good models on how to produce those things. The other thing that affects things is the smaller you go in the mass of the black hole, the more affected you are by Hawking radiation, which should eventually evaporate um, these systems. So there were a couple of additional questions in the chat about like, what's the end of a black hole? Like, do black holes just stay around and keep keep accreting more and more material or do they eventually like evaporate somehow? And the answer is that if left by itself on, on, on its own, um, a black hole does evaporate very, very slow. Well, it can be very, very slowly. Um, they evaporate because they emit something called Hawking radiation, which is was named after Stephen Hawking, who was the first person who proposed this whole idea. And essentially the idea is that as Nikita was describing, you've got your you've got your black hole and you have the event horizon that's surrounding it. And that's essentially the the dividing line between uh, where its gravitational potential is so strong that its escape velocity is the speed of light. So if it's interior to that, then you can't get stuff out. And if it's exterior to it, then you could potentially have something traveling at near the speed of light and escaping from that system, that gravitational system. And so essentially the idea is that, um, due to an effect from, from our understanding of the quantum nature of the universe is that you have particle antiparticle pairs that are kind of popping in and out of existence everywhere. And it conserves momentum and it conserves charge and it conserves all of these things. And so they'll pop into existence and then usually just immediately annihilate. It's, it's like the quantum background. Um, and if you have that occur right on the boundary of the event horizon, one will plummet in to because it can't escape, right? Because that's the nature of the event horizon. It's like a one-way, a one-way gate. So it plummets in, and then the other one uh, escapes. And so it just es essentially robs the black hole of some amount of energy and some amount of mass that starts percolating out. And so you can slowly evaporate these systems. But as you can imagine, that's tied to the surface area of the black hole. And since the surface area of any sphere goes with the, the square of the radius, it's four pi r squared, and the volume of, of, a, of, of a sphere goes with the, the cube, um, four thirds pi r cubed of that sphere, you can see that as something gets bigger and bigger, uh, the ratio of its um, vol volume to surface area goes up. And so it becomes much slower to evaporate those things as you get them more massive. But really, really small black holes should evaporate very, very quickly by this, this process. Sorry, that was a really long-winded ex explanation and I hope it made sense. But um, the, the idea is that we don't have evidence, just as Nikita said, we don't have evidence for really small black holes. That's not to say that they don't exist, but once they become microscopic, they would evaporate ra rather quickly due to this Hawking radiation. Um, but really big ones will take way, 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 way long.
to do this because they have so much mass and so much volume effectively in their, their event horizons. Um, do you guys want to add anything else on that? So it's not just me blathering. I think you answered that well. Okay. Um, oh, and feel free to ask questions regarding, I haven't been checking the chat for moments because I was too busy yapping. Um, feel free to ask questions about uh, the topics that our other two panelists, I know black holes are pretty hot stuff. So you want to ask questions about black holes, but feel free to ask questions about exoplanets as well as uh, cosmic rays and radio astronomy, because those are both pretty intriguing subject matters as well. Subject matter as well. Um, and they're connected too, so. And they're connected as well. There's a lot of synergies between studying black holes and x-rays and radio, because like I mentioned, Black holes can give off jets, which we observe in radio light. Um, so Catherine would be the expert to talk about the radio side. Yeah, so um, relative to that, what are objects that we know about that are visible in both the radio part of the spectrum as well as the X-ray part of the spectrum? Do we have, are there specific astrophysical objects that might be visible in both? And what's the like mechanism by which they emit in radio waves, like the lowest energy electromagnetic waves and X-rays or gamma rays, like the highest energy. Yeah, uh, they're surprisingly connected. A lot of a lot of objects that have X-ray emission are also have radio emission, and it's not necessarily from the same the same part or the same mechanism. But even our sun, when it has a solar flare, uh, that's something that you can observe in just about every wavelength of, of light. But there's actually a correlation between the radio strength of the radio emission and the strength of the x-rays. And this has to do with uh, how the, the particles that are involved in the flare get energized and how the, the sun's corona gets its energy, which is not properly understood yet. Uh, but so, yeah, uh, the sun is an example. Some other stars are, are also an example. And then uh, black holes and especially the black holes at the centers of galaxies are observable in, in the radio and in, in X-rays. There are um, also objects called gamma ray bursts, which are essentially to spell out the word bursts of gamma rays, which we don't quite know uh, what's the source. Um, it's a big uh, question of what, what powers gamma ray bursts, but um, they don't just emit in the very highest energy end of the spectrum, but in gamma rays, but also throughout the entire ele electromagnetic spectrum. So we see we see jets which are producing being produced from shocks, um, and that basically um, triggers all the way down from X rays all the way to radio radio light um, because these jets when they when they slam into material in their surroundings, they tend to give off a lot of radio emission. And that's why um, you can see the entire spectrum of a lot of astrophysical phenomena that are jet-like or that have strong ejections of material into their surroundings. Um, there was a question that someone had about what astronomical ob objects apart from black holes are high emitters of X-ray radiation, or specifically hard X-ray, but but we've talked about black holes. Um, so, what are some of these other? I think this actually relates to probably the science that everyone on this this does, because I think all of these can can influence things. Um, I can think like late type stars can have convective atmospheres that that generate a kind of effectively a corona that has that that's X-ray heavy. Um, yeah, I will briefly oh. mention that for the planets that I study, that effect is actually really important because X-rays and high energy radiation in general can um, generate a lot of heat in planetary atmospheres by photoionizing uh, various elements in the planet's atmosphere. So basically it makes it a pretty bad place to live if you're around a star that's putting out a ton of X-rays and extreme ultraviolet radiation. Um, 
So how does the, I mean, you mentioned, Nikita, you mentioned solar flares. Um, Shreyas, are these, these are more powerful than the solar flares that our, that our sun would, would give? Yeah, definitely. So some of them are so strong that you can actually see them in white light. Like with solar flares, sometimes it's easier to see things in x-ray, but actually for a lot of the flares that you look at from, for instance, M dwarf stars, red dwarf stars, you can basically see them in the optical with telescopes like Kepler or TESS or the Hubble Space Telescope. And that kind of indicates that they are putting out a lot of energy during these flare events. And in some cases they can even, like in these super flare events, they can even um, go from being invisible to a telescope to being like very visible and outshining other objects. Interesting, so you've got your red, your red dwarf star and there's some convection in the, in the interior of, of the star that breaks out and forms this super flare or whatever. And it's both, it's both visible in the X-ray because it's pumping a bunch of X-ray, but it's also visible in the visible part of the, that we could see with our eyes. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it'd be pretty hard to actually see with your eyes, but. Right, right, <laughs> these are distant objects and such, but okay, hmm, intriguing. And those, and Catherine, you were saying that that sort of phenomena would also be potentially visible in the radio part of the spectrum as well? Yes, uh, and and that's because the charged particles that are involved uh, get accelerated in the magnetic field of the object. And these, in, in particular, these low mass stars, even though they're, they're uh, much lower temperature than our sun, they have they tend to have much stronger magnetic fields. And so the particles can uh, get uh, wound up a lot in the in the magnetic fields. And as that's happening, that makes them radiate ra radio. radiate in the radio. I see in synchrotron, right? Yes. Okay. Just we don't well, want to use synch synchrotron jargon, but... and I. Uh, and some other things related to it. Synchrotron implies that the particles are are traveling very close to the speed of light, and uh, they might in in stellar flares uh, and and in stellar emission when it's not a flare, there are particles that are traveling somewhat fast, but not necessarily the speed of light. And so that things like geosync, gyrosynchrotron, and yeah. Okay. Cool. Um... The Jerry RN asks, with only one newer hard X-ray telescope active, how high is the priority level to launch additional high energy X-ray telescopes? I mean, you talked a little bit about this during your presentation, Nikita, in terms of Athena launching pretty soon. And um, unfortunately, well, perhaps fortunately for the rest of astronomy, unfortunately, Lynx wasn't chosen as part of the decadal, which would have been like a super awesome X-ray telescope. but. But it seems like, like X-ray astronomy is doing okay in, on, in its prospects for the next 20 or so years, right? Because of these new instruments coming online? Yeah, I think definitely there is, um, you know, there's still scope for improvement in terms of New Star is still the only high energy X-ray telescope in um, in orbit that has, you know, the greatest high energy X-ray coverage. It's not the only one right now. So there is a Russian satellite um, called SRG, and mm -hmm. there is an instrument on that Russian satellite called ART-XC. And it is also a focusing X-ray telescope that can focus like higher energy X-rays than, than most X-rays uh, X -ray satellites that are in orbit. Um, not as high energy as New Star gets to, but it is a technically a focusing high energy X-ray telescope. The downside is because it's Russian, it's 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 a Russian telescope. Um, the data isn't really available to the whole world. It's pretty much controlled by Russia and Europe. It's a joint collaboration between Russia and Europe. So it's hard to get access to data. It's, it's proprietary basically. So definitely um, it would be great if there were plans for a new hard X-ray telescope to actually be launched. And the telescope that I described at the end of my talk, HEXP, was kind of a concept mission that would replace New Star essentially and be like 
New Star 2.0, um, but it's only a concept mission. And this is why we do things like the decadal survey. Um, we try to really pitch these new telescope ideas um, and try to emphasize the import importance of having um, complementary um, space missions or ground-based missions for different wavelengths. Um, because these, these newer telescopes that are definitely going to be launched, like Athena and CRISM, they are lower energy X-ray telescopes. And I think although the decadal was being a little vague in, in what it was recommending, it, I think it's implicitly trying to push for more X-ray probes that can complement the full band of X-rays that we can observe um, to try and push for telescopes like HexB to be developed and launched. Because so, you can see different phenomena with hard X-rays versus soft X-rays. Exactly. X -ray. okay. Exactly. You're basically it's 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 a new lens. You're really detecting like the analogy is like the hotter the hotter light, um, which gives us a lot more information about objects. Um, like you can't really measure a temperature for the corona without that information, for example. So um, because of that, there's definitely a solid science case for launching hard x-ray telescopes and this is why the astronomy community gets together and tries to to put together these kinds of reports to push for agencies like nasa to develop telescopes like that uh forgive me if you already mentioned it but is there a is there a fuel that's being consumed by new star such that it will only last another year or another five years before it just kaputs in the same way that, you know, Spitzer space telescope had cryogenic coolant that was present that needed to be present in order for it to operate. Or James Webb has propellant to keep it in orbit around the, the second Lagrange point. And once it runs out of that in 10 ish years, it's just gone. Is there a, a planned kind of obsolescence date for new, new star? So New Star is actually a really efficient telescope because it's like a small explorer mission. And this also, I think, answers a couple of the other questions in the chat about like where, where does New Star live in space and stuff. So New Star occupies a low, low Earth orbit. So it orbits very closely around the Earth. Um, so it doesn't really require uh, a fuel source because it's just orbiting around the Earth. So you don't need to expend energy if it was orbiting in like an L2 Lagrange point. And so the thing that's going to limit uh, the lifetime of New Star isn't really fuel, but the lasers. So I told you how the focal length of X-ray telescopes and particularly New Star is really long. It's 10 meters long in space. That whole mast extended out to 10 meters in space. And the way that mast motion is controlled is using this laser system. So there are lasers pointing from the optics to the detectors that's constantly correcting for the motion of the masts. And these lasers, the power of those lasers can decay over time. And so the laser power right now, like the, like the lifetime of that is what's really determining the lifetime of New Star. It is a slow decay process. The New Star does have at least another 10 years to go. And even if one laser fails, it can still technically run on the other laser. Um, but really that that's kind of more of the limiting factor in, in the life cycle of New Star. I see. So it, the laser itself is powered presumably by solar panels or something like that. But you're just saying over time, the laser itself just, you know, when you leave something on for 10 years, yeah, the, the intensity goes start down. to I see, yeah. the efficiency is, okay. Interesting. That's cool. Well, at least there's still 10 years on it. No, that's that's good good amount of time, but uh, okay. How about at which wavelength? Uh, Kiran Meta asks, at which wavelength does the solar corona shine the brightest? The solar corona shine the brightest. Oh, does anybody happen to know? Uh, well, first of all, maybe. At which wavelength does the the active galactic nucleus uh, corona shine the brightest? You said this is generally in the harder part of the X-ray spectrum, right? Yeah, I mean, the, 
in a general sense, in x-rays is where it shines the brightest. I think that was the point of my talk. But um, we call the coronal emission hard x-ray emission um, just because it, it's a bit of a technicality at this point, but um, it's, it's just higher energy x-rays than the highest that you could produce from the accretion disk itself. So stellar mass black holes, um, those that have accretion disks around them, we call them low mass X-ray binaries. Uh, they also have a corona um, and shine really brightly in the X-rays. Um, but they can emit X-ray light from the accretion disk itself. But that X-ray light is in the softer end of the spectrum, whereas the light from the corona itself is higher energy, it's hard X-rays. So in an, in an energy sense, I, I think this is getting too technical for the audience, but it's above 10 keV is, but it, but the corona produces most of the X-rays period uh, from a black hole. Okay, thank you. Uh, I like this question from, I'm going to probably mess up this Vietnamese name, Phong Phan Hu. Uh, do galaxies form around supermassive black holes or do supermassive black holes go to the center of galaxies once they already exist? Like a chicken or the egg kind of question. Um, I can kind of answer this because I do these computer simulations. And the answer is, we don't entirely know um, because as far, as far, okay. So the farther you look uh, at more distant objects, the earlier in the evolution of the universe you're seeing them. So if you look you know, across the room, it might be present day galaxies, but if you look on the other side of town, it's like galaxies that existed a uh, hundred years ago. And if you look on the other side of the country, it's galaxies that existed um, much earlier than that. I mean, I'm using obviously local coordinates, but you get the idea. If we look at, if we, if we point our telescopes at the things on the other side of the universe, the time travel, uh, the, the light time travel that it's taken that light to get to us is, you know, a few billion years. And so we're looking at those things in the past. Now, when we do that, we already see galaxies that have these supermassive black holes inside of them. So it's difficult to speculate on, on what happened, but we believe that the, the supermassive black holes form in situ, that they form in the galaxies during the formation of the galaxy. Um, but you're right that the galactic potential, the gravitational force drawing things into the center of the galaxy. Um, we, we do have mechanisms by which a supermassive black hole could get kicked around uh, through a merger with another one, and that might send it outside of the galaxy. And eventually, though, uh, galaxies, because they have so much mass and thus so much gravitational pull, essentially, are really nice places for things to kind of fall into them. Much like you think of uh, some of the, the images that Nikita showed early in her talk, you people think of like the shape of space time as being like this warped, um, like a warped piece of latex or whatnot. And when you place a mass into that, it, it droops it a little bit and makes a nice little valley and things are more prone to falling into that space time valley. It's, it, that, that's kind of the analogy that we like to use. And so the galaxy, a galaxy will provide a nice warp in that space time that draws things into it. So um, at least from the simulations that we see when we run them forward to today, galaxies eat their neighboring galaxies and pull them in. So if I'm a larger galaxy and I pull in, you know, this lovely pumpkin shaped galaxy into, into me, that galaxy also has a supermassive black hole in it, just as I do. And eventually I can efficiently bring that in and those two supermassive black holes hopefully will, will merge and form a larger one that's proportional to the mass of that entire system. So we do see evidence for that, but that's a very good question because we don't really know. We, we, think, we, we think that it forms in situ in the early universe, but we don't have 
We don't have good observational evidence for that yet. Hopefully James Webb will help to answer that because it's going to be able to see to earlier kind of epochs in the universe's evolution than we've been able to see before. Uh, let's see, some other questions. There's so many questions. These are really good. Here's a question from Andrew Reitemeyer. Are there mechanisms in intervening space that can accelerate a high energy particle after it has been emitted? Seems appropriate so, for Catherine and cosmic ray, uh, the cosmic yeah, I think this ray is a, description. A question about cosmic rays. And I, uh, there, I guess it depends on what you mean by where it's emitted. And so if say it's coming from a, a supernova, most of the acceleration won't actually happen in the supernova explosion itself. It'll happen when that uh, remnant of material emanating out from where the supernova had happened is uh, running into the interstellar medium and also running into itself in kind of shock waves, like I uh, like breaking waves on on the beach where where the uh, water re reaches a point that there's kind of a sudden discontinuity in the in the speed speed of the water on each side. And actually those shocks are where the particles get accelerated. And this is be because they uh, get turned by magnetic fields because they have a charge. And so they can't just keep going uh, straight through the shock and onward to the other side. They end up getting kind of bounced back and forth. So that, that's where the acceleration happens. But then once the particle uh, leaves that region where it's accelerated, there are uh, some things that can happen to it. It can run into something and break into smaller particles, uh, which is kind of rare, but does happen. And it can get accelerated in the sense that it will change direction in magnetic fields, but it won't, in free empty space, it won't uh, gain more speed. Uh, and so, so in that sense, there isn't much to accelerate it after it leaves whatever region has these shock waves that are doing the accelerating. Thank you, Catherine. Sierra Koth asks, how much mass will Jupiter be able to accrete from the dying red giant sun when the, when the, we all, well, maybe we all don't know. The sun is not going to live forever, and it's going to turn into a red giant, and it's going to be bad news for us here in the inner solar system. And when it does, it's going to puff up, and Shreyas, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's going to basically like puff up to the degree where it's going to encompass the orbits of all the rocky planets, right? All four of us, roughly? Yeah, I think there's some debate on what happens to the orbits like as, as it puffs up. It, as it puffs up, but yeah, in in general, I think that's the idea. Okay. So then the the question that we have here is how much of the sun and the outer layers of the sun will like affect Jupiter? Will they get absorbed by Jupiter? Will Jupiter fall in? Like what's going to happen? Yeah, so I think it's a really interesting question. Um, maybe uh, we can think about this together, but the way that I kind of envision the problem is you have Jupiter, which is basically this little tiny sphere that lives out at five astronomical units. And whatever size the red giant sun is at whatever stage, it's kind of ejecting mass in all directions you can assume at first approximation so the like the total area that all of that material will encounter jupiter at is is pretty small like the overlap between jupiter's kind of sphere of influence it's mm. hill sphere to be like precise and the entire you know four pi steradians over which this wind is emitted to again be a little overly technical um, in, all, in all directions. In all directions, right? And I think because that area is so, so small, it, it should be like, it should be approximately the radius of Jupiter squared over its orbital distance squared. And that number is real small. It's like 10 to the minus 10. Um, 
So unless the red giant sun, for whatever reason, is blasting a ton of material in all directions, um, which I'm not sure is the case, it, I, I would say it's pretty unlikely. But it's a really interesting thing to think about. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I guess would that material be also accompanied by enough radiation that it would like blow off the outer layers of the atmosphere, like the Ju the 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 Jupiter atmosphere, or or would it oh. be yeah, would it be accreted, or would it like ablate the whole thing? I, I, was, I, I don't know. I was thinking about it in terms of accretion, but I guess yeah, if it has enough like momentum. It's, yeah, I suppose it depends on the velocity. I don't know enough about late late time late type or late evolution uh, stellar evolution. So maybe you guys do. <laughs> okay. How about, how about this? Darsh Shah asks, was the universe created by the Big Bang and do we have any strong proof of this? I like this because this is like something that we all ask ourselves too. Um, uh, feel free to chime in. I was just going to say, the main thing I wanted to say was, I think everyone's intuition, at least I can speak from personal sense. Uh, my intuition growing up was just that the universe was infinite in all directions and it had been around for an infinite period of time. Maybe that was just like my childhood intuition. But, um, but it, and that was generally what kind of what the accepted theory was. It's called the steady state model of the universe because it, it's steady state. It's unchanging and it goes on forever. But um, that was kind of upended by this 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 big bang theory um starting really in like the 30s and 40s um but gained more more support uh later in the 50s 60s and 70s and it seems to me we have three pieces of evidence that are really consistent with that um the expansion of the universe that was basically first detected by edwin hubble using the mount wilson telescope that's it's like six miles that way, uh, just north of Pasadena and Los Angeles. So he he discovered that the, he looked at distant galaxies and saw that they were moving away from us. They were all moving, well, all except for Andromeda, were moving away from us. And the farther they were from us, the faster they were moving away from us. And you might be like, well, that's really weird. But the explanation makes sense. And that is that spa if space itself is expanding, then the more space you have in between you and another object, the faster that object's gonna be going away from you. And it's not that we're at the center of the universe. Any, anyone in any location in the universe will see other things traveling away from them because of that expansion. And so if something is expanding, it, it, uh, you can kind of backtrack on that and say like, well, a billion years ago, if everything's expanding now, then everything would have been closer together. And if you go like two billion years back, then everything would have been even closer together. And so you can kind of like backtrack this back enough time and then be like, well, at 14 billion years ago, everything would have been sitting on top of each other. And that's the idea of the, the Big Bang, basically, that there was some initial point, initial time, and then everything began expanding from that. And we can kind of calibrate that from the rate at which other things are traveling away from us and the distance at which they're, they are from us. But there are two other pieces of evidence. I'm trying to remember what they are. Do you guys remember? Oh, right, CMB and trace CMB. elements of trace elements of, of uh, low mass elements, brilliant, lithium, beryllium, and boron, right? I think those are the three pieces of evidence. Yeah. There, there are, so most of the elements that are on the periodic table are made in stars. And there's a few elements that shouldn't be made very much in stars or even should be destroyed in stars. And the Big Bang would have had just the right conditions to make them. And if you calculate how much should have been made in the way we think the Big Bang works, it matches uh, right about the amount that we see of those elements. Exactly, exactly. Because in the, during the Big Bang, as you can imagine, when everything was on top of each other, it was really dense and it was really hot. And those were the conditions that were a lot like the conditions in the middle of a star 
or a, a nuclear reactor. It's super hot and it's super dense. And so you're fusing stuff. And yeah, we made a bunch of helium. Well, we, we, the universe made a bunch of helium at that point, but it, it requires more energy and more heat to make heavier elements. And so the universe was barely able to make this kind of was barely able to make some some lithium and beryllium and boron, but not really anything more than that. And so we see the right amount, the right amount, according to kind of this Big Bang model to account for that. And then who wants to talk about the CMB? I guess I can talk about it. Um, so for, for people who aren't familiar with what this stands for, it stands for the cosmic microwave background radiation. So um, in the like late, um, like around the 1960s or so, there were um, these two uh, astronomers that basically was, were detecting um, this kind of microwave noise coming from the sky in all directions. And you can also see some of this microwave radiation if you have one of those really old fashioned cath cathode ray tel um, TVs as a kind of fuzzy static. So these microwaves, um, they're not coming from within our earth, but from every direction in the universe. And it's pretty uniform and isotropic, the microwave radiation that we're seeing. And what this microwave radiation is, is it's a very strong evidence of the Big Bang theory, because according to the Big Bang, um, the early universe, which was very hot and energetic and very compact, over time expanded. But initially, most of the particles were not neutral. They were single protons or electrons and other energetic particles just floating around in this soup of plasma. But because of the expansion of the universe that causes it, the universe itself to cool over time. And what this means is that the temperature dropped enough that single protons and electrons could combine and form hydrogen. And, uh, when that happened, light was emitted and um, these photons basically traveled the entirety of the space of the universe. And we see it now in microwave light. Um, it had a much higher energy when it was emitted, but because of this expansion of the universe that Cameron was describing that basically stretches out the wavelength of the light, we call this um, the cosmological redshift, everything is moving away from us. And so the light is reddened um, by all these objects. And so that light got basically redshifted to such an extent that now we see it as microwave radiation. And so the fact that we, so we call that, that, that time when um, uh, protons and electrons uh, combine to form hydrogen, the epoch of recombination, and uh, we're seeing what we call the surface of last scattering when that was the last time that like individual particles that weren't combined to form atoms um, were able to scatter off light. And um, once it became neutral, that didn't happen anymore. And so those were the last photons uh, from that scattering event uh, that were produced and they traveled through the entirety of the universe and became stretched in the pro process to become microwaves. And we detect that and we have satellites called Planck um, that can, to incredible depth, map out this cosmic microwave background radiation, measure its temperature, um, apply models of Big Bang models to that data, which fit it really, really well. So that's a really strong indicator of um, the Big Bang being the origin of the universe. Excellent, excellent explanation. So yeah, so there is evidence. There are these three key pieces of evidence that suggest that that the Big Bang theory is is uh, is an appropriate 
kind of paradigm for how our universe came to be and how it's continuing to evolve. It's not perfect, and we will probably have corrections to that over in 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 the future time. In fact, about twenty years ago, we had to uh, we had to add in the idea of dark energy um, as something that's accelerating this expansion based on additional observations of distant galaxies that suggest that the universe isn't just like expanding and then it's going to collapse. It's actually expanding and it's accelerating in its expansion. But we still don't know a lot about uh, dark energy. So that's that's an area that we need to to uh, to continue to study to to better understand it. But but yeah, Big Bang, at least right now, Big Bang cosmology is kind of the 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 model that's favored by the evidence that we have. I, I wanted to add just uh, one more observational evidence that isn't as detailed as some of the other uh, things that we were talking about. But uh, if you imagine that the universe went on forever with stars and galaxies evenly spread out, Ooh. then uh, the sky would not be black at night. And that's because if you imagine we see, we can see a certain number of stars out to some distance, uh, as you go, as you go farther and farther, and ask, like draw draw a sphere around yourself and say how many stars would be within that sphere, and then make make the radius bigger and ask how many stars are within the bigger sphere. The number of stars, if everything is evenly spread out forever, would go as the the square of the radius. But the uh, amount of light that you get from something decreases as the square of the radius as they, things get fainter as they're if they're farther away from you and so if everything were if you were in the middle of just a sea of stars endlessly spread out evenly forever then the farther out in volume you're trying to look at the fainter it would be but the more things there would be and so the sky should you, sh you shouldn't really see a black night sky because you would even though at some distance you wouldn't see individual stars anymore you would get this even amount of light from the universe and so just the fact that we don't see that means that the we can't be sitting in an endless even sea of stars the universe has to have either a finite spatial extent or a finite age or both or both right and right now it looks like we definitely think it has a finite age which is around 14 billion years. And we don't really know if it has a finite extent. It could be infinite in extent, but we only talk about the observable universe, which is the distance, as Catherine was alluding to, kind of this boundary between how far something is away from us. Um, we can only see within our sphere of influence um, something where the light travel time is less than the age of the universe. And beyond that, we have no information. It's kind of like our own cosmological event horizon, basically. We can't see beyond that because we haven't had enough time for the photons to travel from those more distant locations to us in the age of the universe. So excellent point. Thanks for bringing that up. Oh, and 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 just for reference, just so people know, that's typically referred to as Olber's para paradox, that if you if you live in an infinitely old and infinitely extended uh, universe, when you look up in the sky, it's not dark. It's 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 glowing bright because you're looking at the surface of a star at some distance away, right? So Olber's paradox. Uh, okay, I liked this question, which I think is directed primarily at Nikita, and that is from Suhail Vallej. What impact does a tidal disruption event have on the corona? And I guess, can you tell us what a tidal disruption event is? Yeah, so um, a tidal disruption event is essentially, it's a different kind of phenomenon um, that happens in black holes that don't really have an accretion disk around them. So what is happening in a tidal disruption event is uh, you have a star that's orbiting around a uh, black hole. And um, if it gets too close to the black hole, then um, there will be tidal forces at play that basically result in matter being stripped off of the star. So just like how the tides on the moon, um, the tides affect 
because of the moon, the tides on Earth, um, they push on and exert a force on the Earth. A similar thing happens when um, you basically have objects like stars passing like this tidal radius around a mass, in this case, a black hole, and it'll basically begin to become distorted and have its matter stripped away. And that matter can fall into the black hole. And, and like I told you a lot in this talk, when matter falls into a black hole, light is emitted um, from that material and it causes it to basically light up. Now, with tidal disruption events, and usually this refers to a star being tidally disrupted by a black hole, what we see from those are brief flashes of light. It's typically optical light. You can see flashes in the x-rays. We categorize them differently, um, x-ray tidal disruption events, because we believe that there are also jets being produced from those events. Um, but these kinds of events don't have accretion disks already around them. And usually a, like a corona forms when there is an accretion disk present. And this is actually a pretty exciting area of research where, um, again, advances in both optical and X-ray astronomy are, are allowing us to elucidate more about what exactly is going on during this event and how is radiation being produced. But if, um, if there is enough tidal disruption going on, then you can actually the material that's being disrupted can form an accretion disk around the black hole. And it is possible that after that accretion disk is formed that a corona could be produced. But the corona itself is so enigmatic, even in sources like supermassive black holes and accreting stellar mass black holes where we know the corona exists, we still don't know how it even formed in those kinds of systems, let alone how a corona could form from a tidal disruption event that produced an accretion disk. So that's really even more up to speculation, whether a corona could even form, how long it would take to form, and whether we would see X-ray light, uh, because there isn't really that much material there uh, to basically produce a corona and, and have the X-ray light being emitted. You can't really study tidal disruption events in AGN because an AGN already has an accretion disk. And so if you see a flare in an AGN, that could just be because suddenly there was a lot more matter that was accreted in the accretion disk. And so AGN actually, if you monitor how bright they are, their, bright, their brightness can often fluctuate over time. We call this variability, and that's a pretty common and common phenomenon in AGN. That's just part of the life cycle of all of this matter in an accretion disk being um, fed into the black hole. And sometimes more matter can be fed in, sometimes a little less, and that causes the light that we see from the black holes to fluctuate. So if a tidal disruption event did happen in an AGN, we couldn't really distinguish that from just a normal flaring event. One thing that you um, discussed in your presentation that was surprising to me. So the accretion disk itself, that's all this stuff that's rotating around in a nice like Saturn's rings around the black hole. Um, and that stuff is, you know, gas and stars and ripped up planets and everything. And it's going to fall into the black hole. You said that that primarily emits in the visible part of the spectrum and it only gets Compton scattered like up to X-ray x-rays from the from the corona yeah so what's basically happening is i told you that the corona it's it's a really energetic plasma so the particles in that corona have a lot of energy so normally when things scatter off each other when when light scatters off matter for example it it loses energy as it gives off some of its energy to the particle but the reverse is happening in the corona so um, we see, so the visible light in the accretion disk, it's, it's what we call black body radiation. Um, each, each basically ring, like if you imagine the accretion disk to be like lots of rings, um, is at a certain temperature and emits optical light that we can see at that temperature. And so if you stack up all of those rings, what you get is basically a continuum of, of visible light. Um, 
from all of those different temperatures. Um, but because the corona is so energetic, those particles have so much energy. That means that when a, a visible light a photon scatters off an electron, say, in the corona, the electron is what's giving up its energy to the light. And so the light is what ends up having more energy, not, not the particle. So that's why, again, to get technical, it's called Compton upscattering because the light's energy is being boosted up. It's going from visible light to X-ray light. Right. Compton downscattering is where the light loses energy. And so um, its wavelength becomes longer. So downscattering, for example, would be if if the X-ray light turned into optical light. But, and it accelerated a particle, yeah. or something like that, but this is the reverse. Okay. Yeah, I just, I always thought the accretion disk was itself was emitting X-rays. So that was something I learned today. Something I learned today, and I've had a PhD for a while. So thank you for teaching me that. Um, it, it can emit X-rays, um, again, in like stellar mass black holes that have an accretion disk. Um, the way that black body radiation looks is that very close to the black hole, as you get closer to the black hole, things become hotter. So the, the hottest regions that are really close to the black hole can shine in the lower energy X-rays. I see. Okay. But to get the super, uh, the super hard X-rays, the super high energy X-rays, it, it takes an AGN and it's from this corona. Okay. We have a number of black hole questions, perhaps unsurprisingly. Here is, here's a good one from Kiran Mehta. If black holes won't let anything inside the event horizon to escape, how do they emit hard X-rays that you know, New Star is picking up? How, how, how are these black holes actually emitting light if they're, if they're black holes and nothing can escape? Yeah, so it's definitely true that when anything passes the event horizon, it cannot escape. So when I mean a black hole shines brightly, what I mean is that the, the particles that are falling into the black hole, as they are falling in, they cause the black hole to shine. So technically it's the accretion disk that's shining and then the corona, which is somewhere around the black hole. We don't know where, it could be above the black hole. It could be really close to the black hole. It could be in, like encompassing it. Uh, that then emits X-rays through this Compton scattering process. So it's, so it, so it's, it's all this it's, stuff that's outside of the event horizon. It's the stuff that's falling into the event horizon, essentially. That's what's emit, that's what's resulting in light being emitted from the black hole system. Got it. Um, yeah, a couple more questions about black holes. Uh, Alkai Kane asks, if we have a supermassive black hole in our galaxy named Sagittarius A star, how does it affect our planet or does it affect it at all? Is it drawing our planet closer to the center of the galaxy? Is it destroying planets? Is it pushing us away? What's going on? Is Sagittarius A star really bad for us? What do we know about it? Yeah, so the thing about black holes is that even the supermassive ones that are like millions of times the mass of our sun, there's still a, a sphere of influence that they have. So they have a very well-defined event horizon, which is, um, again, it's a pretty small region around the black hole. And then even the accretion disk that forms around it. Sagittarius A star right now doesn't have an accretion disk, but when it did have an accretion disk, it was still concentrated to the very inner regions at the center of our galaxy. And so that they still shine very brightly, but there's kind of sphere of influence of, of gravity. Ah, uh, sorry. Isn't, sorry. No, I'm trying to find a video to, to show this and I left the sound on, I'm sorry. Um, so so the, the, the thing about like objects around black holes is that even if you're close to the black hole, you're not, you, you can still get super close and just be orbiting around it. It depends on the kind of uh, trajectory that you have around the black hole, because if you have a certain velocity in a certain direction, then you can just be orbiting around it and, and then just slowly fall in as energy is dissipated. So it, it depends on like the direction that you're moving in. 
if you just are moving in a straight line towards the black hole, then you will eventually hit that black hole. But um, just like with any any object that has mass, um, if you have a certain amount of velocity, like tangential to that object, then you're going to go around in an orbit around that object. Absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry about making noise while you're during your explanation. <laughs> um, I was trying to find that one of the cool movies. So Sagittarius A star was was all up in the news. Wasn't it 2020's Nobel Prize that was awarded to all the Sagittarius, all the black hole stuff? Was it 2020? Time has passed in a very strange way in the last few years. So I don't remember. I don't think it was this year though, right? Wasn't it this was year? 2020. Okay. okay. So so yeah, alluded to Andrea Ghez uh, was awarded it with Reinhard Genzel because of their work studying this supermassive black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy that's known as Sagittarius A star. Um, and there are nice animations that show how we basically know that it's a black hole because of the orbits of the stars around it. So that black hole doesn't necessarily have um, it's not accreting a lot of matter, so you don't have an active galactic nucleus like the stuff that Nikita was showing um, throughout her presentation. And, but you can, yeah, you can basically figure out the presence of it from the trajectories, from the orbits of these stars. But I, yeah, um, maybe, is it worth showing the movie, you think, or no? I, I think part of the question was, how does it affect us oh, on Earth? Oh, yes, good And so point. I guess maybe the, best answer to, or we're, we're orbiting the center of the galaxy, but that's not just the mass of the black hole that we're orbiting, it's the mass of everything in, in the center of the galaxy. And so we, we do go around it, but we're not falling into it. We're pretty stably going around it. And, and we, we go around it as we're going around the sun because the sun is also going around it. So yeah, in that sense, it doesn't, a good it doesn't point. directly affect us. That's a very good point because I think people people oftentimes have an intuition based on our solar system. You know, you've got the Earth and you've got all the planets orbiting around the center of our solar system, the Sun. Um, and so you think, well, our solar system is going around the center of the Milky Way, so there must be some other massive object in the center of the Milky Way that's causing this Keplerian orbit. But yeah, just as you say, Catherine, that is. There is a massive object there, but it's not nearly the same mass ratio as we have in our solar system. In our solar system, the sun, ooh, I gotta use my pumpkin again. The sun is 99.99% of the mass of our solar system. So we're just little, little like sand grains going around the sun in terms of our mass ratios. Whereas in the, so in the, in the galaxy, um, yes, you have a, a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, but the ratio of that mass to the rest of the stuff in the galaxy is like, instead of it being 99.99% of the mass, like it is with the sun, um, the mass of that supermassive black hole relative to the mass of the galaxy is like 0.0001% of the mass of the galaxy. So yes, it's massive and it's much more massive than our sun and other stars, but it's it's only like a few million, right? Isn't it like you know, like 50 million or 10 million? I don't remember off the top of my head. It's a few million times the mass of the sun, whereas the, the galaxy itself is like a trillion times the mass of the sun. Uh -huh. So it takes, yeah, it's orbiting around just the center of mass of the galaxy because there's a bunch of stuff as opposed to this object. And as Catherine says, yeah, we're not falling in, don't worry. Even if we were, it'd take a long time to get there. Uh, it's a long place away. So, sell your real estate, at least not for that reason. Maybe, maybe the market is good. I don't know. I don't follow real estate. Um, okay. I guess we've kind of talked about this, but maybe it's worth doing explicitly. Purple Bam Three asks, "How does a black hole form?" I guess you talked about. Different formation <laughs> What's that? I said rewatch my talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess just summarizing, you've got stars that can collapse late in their, evo their evolution and form stellar mass black holes that are on the order of the mass of the sun or other stars. And then there are 
these supermassive ones, which we don't fully understand. They could be primordial. They could be from a direct collapse of one of the early stars. They could be, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different mechanisms, but they seem to be like two separate categories almost. Do we have evidence for intermediate black hole mass black holes? I thought that the most intermediate mass black hole that we saw was from LIGO and it was, or no, was it from LIGO? And it was like, it was like 50 solar masses or something like that. But bridging the gap between like one to 50 solar masses and like a million solar masses, there's not a huge amount of evidence for, for those other intermediate ranges, right? Yeah, there's not any direct evidence. There's been some tentative, like indirect evidence of like objects orbiting around um, really, really massive invisible objects that may be around 10,000 solar masses. Um, so Hercules X1 is an example of that. Uh, but it's not, there isn't any direct observational evidence of intermediate mass black holes existing that you know we're, we're we can actually see them and observe them so far there are just some there's like a tentative inference that it might exist sorry i'm distracted trying to figure out questions from the comments here um we've only got about 15 minutes left so How about, here's a, here's a question. Um, have there been any interesting exoplanet discoveries from the TESS mission? Kind of sh switching, switching gears here. Um, the TESS mission being kind of the, the, the follow-up to the Kepler mission, right? For studying exoplanets, is that? Yeah, so uh, whereas the Kepler mission kind of stared at one, defined patch of sky for four years continuously trying to find exoplanets. The test mission kind of takes the opposite approach and stares at most of the sky in kind of like 30 day chunks of time looking at each patch that it goes over until it covers the whole thing. Uh, and yeah, I think TESS is starting to uncover some really interesting, cool systems. Not only cool because, you know, there's all sorts of wacky things like just the other day, uh, I think I saw that there was like a super mercury that was discovered. So something that's like the size of the earth, but is so massive, is so heavy that around 70% of its mass has to be a core, like an iron core in the same way that mercury is mostly dominated by its core. Um, so I found that pretty, pretty amazing. Oh, wait, actually. I didn't know that mercury is mostly dominated by its core. It has like a super massive, like a large core relative to its total size. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think oh. I, I vaguely recall the number also being similar to 70%, but uh, in terms of volume. That's interesting. So presumably just at that close proximity to the sun, it the sun ablated and burned off any of the extra layers or something about the formation mechanism led to it? Or I think it's there's still some considerable debate. I I'm not a super expert on Mercury, but I do... I do recall there being some kind of proposal of like a hit and run collision <laughs> while it was forming, taking off some of the mass that was on the top. Um, but huh. who's to say? That's interesting. But it doesn't, it doesn't still have an active interior. That, it doesn't have a magnetic field, does it? Right? I don't think it does. I mean, you think, I mean, maybe if it had this massive core, maybe when it did, it was like, yeah. This big shield block and everything, um, but I don't think it does anymore, does it? Yeah, well, I think there's there's a few other things that you have to satisfy. I think to get the magnetic field, you need like kind of the liquid metal stuff in the core, but you also need like the right kind of rotation and all that mm -hmm. stuff going on. So, mm -hmm. cool. But yeah, super super Mercury's. Uh, there have been super puffy planets that have been discovered. Um, and all of these, I think the big draw of the test mission is that all of these are around really bright stars so that we can go after them and study them with instruments like the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which we're all eagerly awaiting the launch of. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like hopefully it'll actually go forward. Less than a month. Ooh. Ooh. 
Exciting. Oh, uh, speaking of James Webb, it was interesting to me, Nikita, when you were talking about um, New Star, that it too had to kind of unfold because, you know, our rocket rocket chambers are only so large, you know, they're like a few meters across, uh, like 10 feet across. And so you have to fit everything into the rocket and then it takes off. And then if you have something that's larger than that, it needs to unfold. So the big thing with James Webb is, you know, it has to unfold its mirror and it has to unfold its, its heat shield, which is like the size of a, of a tennis court. Uh, but New Star also had to do some sort of unfolding because the focal length of the of the mirror was was 10 meters or or whatever yeah so that was what i showed in the simulation of of the mast basically extending out to the full 10 meters of the focal length of the telescope hmm. and there were no hiccups because i don't want there to be hiccups for jw either with this unfold fingers crossed that was like the most tense 24 minutes of of uh new star's life <laughs> Right, uh, because right. it wasn't something that they could really test on the ground that it was going to be successful. They didn't really like test opening up this mast in, in zero G. They just had to hope that it could be deployed successfully once it was launched. Yeah, finger, fingers crossed that we can repeat that, that uh, uh, next month. All right, uh, a question from Rio Sano. Can I ask how to be a physicist, even if it's brief, just for an inspiration and guide for aspiring high school students who love physics? So I guess this is kind of a question for all of us here. Um, how to be a physicist? What, what are your guys' tips? How to be a physicist? You can probably just like go around the... Sure. You, you can go first, start. thank you. <laughs> I <should laughs> start. Uh, well, I mean, we can all kind of give our personal <laughs> stories of how we became physicists. Um, sure. Having a passion for physics is really important. Um, and kind of knowing that going into college can really help. Um, if you're studying in the US, it's not a big deal to not have it totally figured out whether you want to study physics or not you can still start college in a certain major and then and then take some physics classes and find it super interesting um a really great way to not only make your application look strong but also just find out whether you like to do physics research because physics research is very different from learning physics and so being able to do some kind of research internship or a summer research internship um, can be a great way um, to not only get exposure to the field and really help with just applications, whether it's applying to grad, grad school or there are some really ambitious high schoolers that <laughs> manage to do research in high school, um, it's possible. But it, it can just generally be a great way to assess whether you would want to become a physicist as opposed to just learn about physics. And you need to be comfortable with math. So if you're not, then you are probably not going to enjoy it that much because, I mean, I wouldn't say that I love math, but um, you do use it to extract the physical, the physics that you need from the problem. But just being like comfortable with doing math is, is something if you don't like math, then just it's a red flag. Um, I, I think I would add, because uh, when, when you're in high school, you've had, uh, you haven't had a lot of say in what math classes you've had, your high school offers what it offers. I would say if you, if your high school offers calculus, it's great to try and take that in high school. If your high school doesn't offer calculus, take what math classes you can and try to take calculus in in college because uh, as I agree with Nikita that math is very important but I think you don't you don't just have one chance to decide whether you like math or not and sometimes sometimes you have a class that uh, wasn't at the right pace or was was hard to get into and so like I would say try to give yourself a couple opportunities to get into math and find find what you like about it. Uh, 
don't I, I wouldn't say just don't just write it off uh because of one uh one class that could be off putting it makes me sad when people say like i'm not a math person i'm like well it's not just like you are or you aren't uh gifted in math like sure there are people who are intrinsically gifted in math but i think it's like if you focus on it and study it it'll be okay like you can get by and you can get into it and it's like anything it's a practicable skill that more exposure and more practice you will improve um so yeah i encourage people to to keep trying at it yeah kind of along that same vein i definitely definitely agree that math is probably the biggest thing that got me into physics but yeah I think it's it's more of the language that we speak when we do physics but physics is kind of like the conversation right and I think because of that I always found myself enjoying math more when it was accompanied with physics so that's something that can happen too. Like maybe you don't love your calculus class initially, but like you start taking your first mechanics class or something and you realize like, oh, derivatives actually have this really beautiful physical meeting in real life. You can take that back to your math class and suddenly everything, I, I think there's a lot of synergy between the two is what I'm trying to say. And um, the same goes for other subjects too, like chemistry. I, I think in high school, probably I didn't realize how much things like chemistry and computer science had their place in astronomy and astrophysics. Um, but now I, I use like spectroscopy tools like every day, which is um, largely derived from chemistry. And, uh, you know, we work with computers all the time. So, you know, coding and computer science is really important too. So just know that whatever kind of subfields of STEM you enjoy, there's kind of a place for you and a niche for you. Um, if you explore enough. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Catherine. I, uh, I guess I would also say like be, be open-minded to what things you might have to try along the way. Like maybe, uh, maybe there's there's some subject that you didn't think it would be related, but but physics lead leads you to that, and then and then you try it. Sort of like be be open-minded to learning whatever is going to come along the way, and and keep, I. Uh, but like keep sight of what what were the questions that got you really excited in the first place and just like keep asking all the questions that you think of. I 100% agree with um, Shreyas's assessment that math on itself is interesting to some people and sometimes me, but there were definitely like, I hated linear algebra when I took it as a course. Um, yeah, I thought it was so boring and so abstract. And then and then I took quantum mechanics and I was like, oh, oh, now linear algebra totally makes sense because I'm applying it to a physical system that that has some sort of application, that has something that I can think of it in a different, you know, gain some intuition uh, associated with that. So, so definitely, yeah, I like, you know, math is the way of describing physical problems, but I really like physics because it applies in so many different applications it it's the it's the underlying thing of chemistry of biology of all these different sciences you can essentially boil it down to physics so it's like this low level thing that underpins everything else and i guess math is kind of that for physics too so um but but yeah as just a as a as a data point i didn't study physics as an undergraduate i studied computer science um i i did some coursework in physics but it wasn't my major i actually studied computer science and then and then transition towards doing astrophysics after the fact. And now I do computational astrophysics. And honestly, having a strong coding background is going to be beneficial for pretty much any quantitative science or a lot of almost, I mean, not every job, but lots of jobs um, will have some application increasingly with, with, with programming and computer science. So I think that my, my coding days were not wasted by going into, into, into the physical sciences afterwards. And um, so learning to code, I think is beneficial as well. Anything else you guys want to add? The thing about oh. physics is um, I, kind of opposite to Cameron. Uh, like I didn't really have a strong coding background at all in undergrad. And to this day, I hate coding. But the great thing about physics is that you can find your niche. Um, if you really do love math, then you know, you can really dive into theoretical physics. If you are really focused more on the computer side of 
things and on simulating things, then you can have more of that computer focus. And you don't have to love any of these things specifically. Again, maths is just a language which we use to describe physics. And that's kind of what makes it elegant and um, simple. With other sciences, you don't have to learn a lot of jargon and memorize a lot of things. You just need to know how to use math to solve the problem. That's what makes it interesting. Um, as opposed to like just, just being comfortable with maths, you don't have to love it or have an interest in that of it of itself. And the same goes for whether you have a computer science background or, or anything like that. These are just more like things that are useful in your toolkit. Uh, to become a rounded physicist. Indeed. Anything else you guys want to add related to this? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun journey. Still having fun for the most part. Um, okay, well, that brings us to nine o'clock. Uh, I want to thank Nikita Kamraj. Newly, newly minted Dr. Nikita Kamraj for your excellent presentation and responses to all the myriad questions we had asked from, from me as well as from, from our audience. So thank you very much. And Catherine and Shreyas, excellent work uh, responding to all the questions. I, as I said, I learned stuff from all of you. So I, I benefited from this as well. Um, hopefully our audience did as well. And uh, thank you to our audience for sticking around, joining us on a Friday night. For some of you, it's probably like early Saturday morning. I remember seeing there's some people from New Zealand here and some people from, from all over the place. So uh, thank you for everyone joining us. Our next event is an astronomy on tap in two and a half weeks. That's all about the James Webb Space Telescope and, and uh, how it looks at distant galaxies on the other side of the universe. And then that following Friday, December 10th, we will have another stargazing le lecture just like this, that's three weeks from today, that's all about fast radio bursts, these kind of mysterious explosions on the other side of the universe that we can see as brief, brief little blips of radio waves and what, what they are and what they aren't. I think he's gonna talk about aliens and that it's probably not aliens, um, but, but definitely uh, check it out and we'll, we'll, I'll put the schedule together for the new year pretty soon. So, um, Thanks everybody and have a have a wonderful a wonderful evening.